There's nothing but darkness left here Shake it off and let's take a ride Cause heaven's not far away And I'm not gonna leave you Just humble ourselves before you. Just ask that this time that we have together will be a challenge to speak to our hearts and minds that we may walk out these doors changed, different, something to think about. And so uh, I just ask, Lord, that you allow your Holy Spirit to move in such a way that will open up our hearts and minds in your precious name. Amen. When we take a look at that passage, of 2 Timothy 3.16, and we take a look at some of the observations. One of the first observations we can see is that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, what does that mean? Because when we take a look at all Scripture is given by inspiration, we have to remember that as Paul is writing this, all Scripture, Old Testament was basically their Scripture. There was no New Testament at this time. New Testament didn't come until later on. So all Scripture is referenced as to what Paul is referring to here as the Old Testament. Now, when I accepted Christ as my Savior and and I decided to become a Christ follower, that became my faith. It wasn't mom or dad's faith anymore. It became mine. And as I shared with you earlier, in order for me to understand this faith and this decision that I made, I had to once again go back to Scripture. Didn't know where to start, but I began reading the Scriptures and getting to know the God that I serve. So when Paul is saying all Scripture, once again, he's referring to the Old Testament. The way one acts, the way one defines right and wrong was going to be based upon the Old Testament. It was going to be based upon the Scriptures of the law that was given to them at that time. The promise given by God to save all men from unrighteousness that, was pro- that was, uh, came through Christ, through Messiah. And we can be confident in the Old Testament being inspired by God. And, and the reason that we can be confident in that is because, one, it was the main scripture of the Jewish and Christian faith of that time. They, when you take a look at, at the authors of the New Testament, they were continually referring back to the Old Testament. You read that in the New Testament. You read where Paul will refer back to such and such book in the Old Testament. When you take a look at uh, especially Christ, most importantly, Christ was quoted, you know, by using the the, the Old Testament. And so by those those issues, those, those foundations can give us confidence in knowing that when we read the Old Testament, the Old Testament was already set as Scripture. We can be confident in that today. That once again, if it was good for Christ, then guess what? It should be good for us, right? Okay? So when we look at the Old Testament, all Scripture is God-breathed. Uh, you know, that's, remember, the, the Old Testament. But now we're, we're part of the New Testament. And the question that we have is, through the New Testament, we're given the fulfillment of Christ. We're given doctrine. We're given the, the words that are not based upon a mythical figure. Not just based upon a man, but they're based upon the Messiah. And what gives me confidence to be able to go ahead and say, you know what, what I read in here is true. When I read through the New Testament, I can be confident in knowing that what I'm reading actually took place. When I take a look at, when I read the words of Christ, how can I be confident? 
Well, here we go. You know I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher at heart. I love teaching students. And so here you go. You're going to be my students this morning. You ready? Here we go. In 397 AD, at the Council of Carthage, uh, Council of Carthage finalized one of the oldest New Testaments because at that time, there were forms of New Testaments being circulated throughout, uh, throughout that, the empire at that time. And so the Council of Carthage came together, Carthage came together and finalized one of the oldest New Testaments. The council declared that the letters of the apostles were divine and could not be added to. Now, the way that they came to that was through research and study, making sure that the scriptures that they were looking at really came from the apostles. As the letters were being distributed as early as the 50s, it was not until the second century that many of the books were accepted as a form of scripture. Now, the early church fathers, Polycarp or Papias, who were direct pupils of John, the apostle John, they also wrote literature on, uh, on the divinity of Christ. They also wrote literature on apologetics, on how to defend the gospel. Polycarp and Papias, since they were disciples of John, pupils of John, they themselves accepted a lot of the writings that were being circulated at that time. And so it kind of goes as if it's basically good for them. They knew the apostles. They knew John. They knew there was a direct line. Then it was good for the church. Now, the council of Carthage also had set four standards. And these four standards pretty much are also what we should be using today as well. And these four standards are as follow. The first one was apostolic. It was apostolic standard. It asked the question, does a person have a direct line or indirect line to Christ? That's important, right? So that we can once again be confident. It'd be kind of interesting if there was passages in here that were not directed in line to Christ. And kind of give you an example, when you take a talk about a direct line, John, in 1 John 1 through 3, John says, you know, we have seen, we have touched, we have heard the Word of God. You take a look at Peter, in Peter chapter 2, uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, he says that we are the eyewitnesses of Christ. That would be considered a direct line. When we talk about indirect line, an indirect line would probably be like Mark. Mark wrote his gospel, but he used Peter as uh, instruction and guidance into writing his gospel. When you take a look at Luke, Luke would have been an indirect line to the gospels because he did a lot of investigation with the apostles and eyewitnesses. That would be considered an indirect line. Direct line, indirect line played a very important part to the apostolic standard. The second one is orthodoxy. Does the passage stay in line with the church's teaching? The teaching and the doctrine that was set as a foundation of that time, was it staying in line with that, or was it moving off somewhere else? Was it saying that Jesus Christ was divine, or was it saying that Jesus Christ became divine after His baptism? Okay? Different types of ideas that were being popped into the church and slipping into the church at that time. Does the passage stay in line with the church's teaching? Third, antiquity. Antiquity standard, when was the letter written? When we take a look at the letter itself, especially, was it closer to Christ's death and resurrection, or was it farther away from it? The closer that it was to Christ's death and resurrection, the more valid it was. The farther that it got away from it, it became more questionable. Does that make sense? closer it is to God's Word, it's true. The farther that we get away from it, it becomes questionable. And then you fall off the stage, okay? All right. Fourth. Fourth is ecclesiastical. And that asks the question, are there letters being circulated throughout the church? And are they being accepted? Are they being accepted or questioned? If they're being accepted, then it's pretty much then a valid book. And if it's being questioned, then we need to take a look into that. 
And so these four begin to set the standard of the New Testament. That's why we can be pretty confident that when the Council of Carthage came together in 397 and said, this is divine, this is, this is you know, we, we read 2 Timothy and it was written by Paul, it was written by Paul. There's no question. There's no doubt. When we look at the Gospels and it was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can be confident that it was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Does that make sense? Are you guys with me? Okay, a little education there, okay? That we can be confident that when we get into the New Testament, we can be confident that we're reading what they wrote, okay? So, it takes us now back to 2 Timothy. Because in 2 Timothy, Paul begins to break it down. We take a look at different, another observation, and Paul says it is profitable for doctrine. That means that it answers the questions of how do we see the world created? How do we see human beings? How do we see life after death? How do we determine right from wrong? Scripture, come on, Scripture is profitable for doctrine. It helps us to understand these, different, these four different questions. So here we go. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at a passage in the Old Testament as to what maybe Paul was using as a foundation, okay? And then we're going to go ahead and take a look, well, now what does the New Testament say? So here you go. You ready? I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. Go. Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, we take a look at the Ten Commandments. This was the law. This was the foundation of Jewish culture. This is what they based their doctrine on. So when we take a look at Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, and I've just shorned them up. I didn't use the whole passage, the whole chapter there. But let's just go through these Ten Commandments real quick. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Second, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not make the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Verse 7. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those four deal with our relationship with God. First four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The next commandments deal, deals with our relationship with man. Honor your father and your mother. Verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 15, you shall not steal. 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Now, let's go to, no, let's go to New Testament. You guys ready? Here we go. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Here we go. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. You see, the law shows us our sin. The law shows us our sin. Come on. We're not perfect. We're sinners in need of a Savior. As Paul states, verse 23, for all have sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Through the law, we are able to go ahead and see our wrongdoings. Through Christ, we are redeemed. Okay? Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, meaning that God, that there was, that Jesus was set aside as a sacrifice. Through Christ, the law shows us our sin, but it's through Christ who was set as a, as a sacrifice for us that we are now redeemed in order to understand and know. God. Verse 25, whom God set forth the uh, propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance. God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and justifier of the one which faith. Is.
let the word of God speak for itself. Let's go.